have a God who loves us so much. And the word says, he's our defender. That vengeance alone is his. But we can call upon him. And he will defend us. He says in Psalms 91, he is our shield and our bulwark. says that he will give his angels charge to lift us up so we don't strike our foot against a stone. That is just the one requirement. And sometimes when we don't understand God, we don't understand how we could have such a deep love. But as you dig, dig into the word of God, you will understand his love, his unfailing love towards you. And that he will never leave you nor forsake you. It's us that always walk away. So don't walk away. Turn back and reach your hand out. And he will be for he loves you. You go before I know that you've even gone to win my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you You go.
Together, I understood it. I just didn't put together the three incidences that, that the dove was released. The dove was released in Noah's Ark. And the dove was released in the upper room, came down on like a fire, and then it was released upon Christ. So I hope you listen to the words of this song mostly because it really is a powerful song. God was there at the beginning, his spirit brooding like a dove, spoke the earth into existence, formed creation that he loved. Man was born a perfect image, made to be a friend of God. Meant to dwell within his presence. Yeah, that's where we all belong. Holy Spirit. See you. 
Her eyes on you today. Holy Spirit, we say more. Would you open up the eyes of our hearts that we might see Jesus clearly, to truly know who He is? Father, reveal your Son Jesus to our hearts. We open more to your Holy Spirit and your ministry. To walk beside us. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Amen. Amen. And well, as we continue our worship today, we have some announcements to share with you. So uh, let's turn our attention to the announcements, then we'll look at God's word together today. Hi, welcome to Parkway. I'm David, and I'm so glad we could worship together today. Here are the announcements for this week. Every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m., we have our prayer gathering. And we believe that God is calling every house to be a house of prayer. And in this meeting, we pray for the fullness of Christ in the church. We pray for our government and our leaders. And we care for one another and bring our requests to God. And once a month, we have an in-person prayer gathering called United Prayer. So I hope that if you're in the area, that you'd be able to join us for that. And every Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m., we have our simple church gathering. Our vision here at Parkway is to be a network of simple churches, like they were in the New Testament. And we also have a public corporate expression on Sunday mornings. We are raising up a generation of spiritual mothers and fathers who can make disciples that make other disciples. We're praying for and believing God for 30, 60, 100-fold fruitfulness. And only God could do that. But we're posturing our hearts and seeking to be equipped to learn the New Testament pattern and structure and doctrine and lifestyle 
so that God could use us in this season. There's a video on our website that explains the simple church vision. And so I hope that you will check it out. And also want to invite you to join us for that. And here are some of the events that are coming up. Lastly, for those who would like to support the ministries here at Parkway, one of the ways you can do that is through online giving at parkwayonline.org slash give. So we're so grateful for your partnership and for your support of the ministries here. All right, so let's open our hearts and our Bibles and commit to follow Jesus, to obey Him out of love. And so grateful that we get to do this together as a spiritual family in this season. God bless you. Good. Just to follow up on some of the announcements, we have our church business meeting after church today. And the annual church business meeting sounds so formal and businessy, but it's actually just a, just a family meeting. Um, and so hopefully you can stay. And everyone is welcome to uh, stay afterwards would like to. So if you want to know about what's going on at the church, it would be a great opportunity for everyone. And so that will start right after service. We'll give you a little break and then uh, give you a chance to get some guacamole and salsa and chips. And then we'll get started right after that. Good, good. We are starting a new series of messages today. Um, we did more than 20 messages on the book of Isaiah last year. And I'm like, whew, <laughs> glad we're done with that. <laughs> no, it was actually really good. Went really deep into the book of Isaiah. And this new book, I don't plan on going in-depth today. Today is just the appetizer, the little hors d'oeuvres to get your thoughts flowing in towards this direction. Um, but I, spent, I plan on spending most of the next uh, three months or so is our plan. We'll see how it goes. Uh, a couple of months ago, I got a free sample pack of Bibles and um, s scripture journals and devotionals and just this goodie pack for pastors. You know, what gets pastors excited? Books. What's even better than that? Free books. <laughs> just like opened up the box. I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. And uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the books was a scripture journal I've, I've always been interested in them, but I was so cheap I never bought them. <laughs> so what it is, is just a, a book of the Bible, just one book, and then on the one side it has the scripture, and the other side it just has blank pages and text so that you could take notes. So usually what I do is I just, um, I just print out my own at home or at the church office, and I make my own. Why spend $5 for a scripture journal? <laughs> but anyways, they sent a sample of a scripture journal, I was kind of excited, and then I looked at the title of the scripture journal, and I was a little bit disappointed because it said 2 Corinthians. I thought, I wondered if, I wonder if they just send you whatever they have on stock. Maybe 2 Corinthians is just not popular. <laughs> Maybe it's like, wow, we, we need to give these pastors some free gifts. Oh, we have a ton of 2 Corinthians. Nobody t reads that. Nobody buys that. Let's send them all 2 Corinthians. Or maybe they thought as pastors we needed 2 Corinthians, which, whichever might be the case. Um, I looked at 2 Corinthians, and then I said, ah, I'd never use that. So I gave it away. <laughs> so here I am a couple of weeks later, <clears throat> a couple of months later, and we are going to start a series on the book of 2 Corinthians. <laughs> so who would have known? So I had to print out the pages of 2 Corinthians and, and get it ready. Um, <clears throat> today I just want to talk about a few things before we officially get started next week in studying it. Uh, why do we study books of the Bible? I, I think most of the year here we, I teach out of a book of the Bible. Sometimes I teach out of a theme 
Um, last year, we did mainly the book of Isaiah, and Diane touched on the book of Nehemiah, and we also covered some themes as well, uh, uh, the move of God or the glory of God. But I like touching on entire books of the Bible because one of the things is the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, verse 27, Paul says, For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So I, as a pastor, I feel responsibility to not just give you what I like to eat in the menu of God's Word, but I feel like we need everything that God has for us. Right? What does 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 say? Some scriptures are God-breathed and profitable. No. All scripture is God-breathed, right? And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So if we only eat, uh, for example, like I know a few years ago, there's this popular diet where you only ate bananas. You guys see that diet? Yeah. You just only eat bananas, unlimited bananas, and a little milk and something, and some people were getting unhealthy and sick, and well, surprise, you're not a monkey, <laughs> or whatever monkeys eat, right? Because we need everything that God has made so that we'll be thorough and complete and be healthy so that we could, uh, that our bodies could function properly and we could do everything that we need. So we don't want to follow fad diets, trendy diets. We don't want to only eat things that we like and enjoy and have a taste for. We want to receive the entire word of God so that we will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The flesh, my heart, apart from God, has the funniest way of finding every loophole, every crack that I could to take the word of God and make it say something else so that it'll be easier on me. Right? Isn't that true? Right? And so we want to take God's word in context and learn exactly what God's word says, not just our favorite books, but the entire word of God. It, it intrigues me that 2 Corinthians is so not popular. I've, I've never preached the series on 2 Corinthians, and I've never heard a series on 2 Corinthians. Has anybody just, just curious? No? Yeah. It's not a popular book. Um, it's not definitely a, quote, mainstream book to study. When the ladies get together, you're never going to hear, oh, let's get some coffee and pastries and study 2 Corinthians. It's just, just not going to happen because it's... It's not a mainstream Christian message. <laughs> and um, so we want to talk about why a little bit. Um, what does God want to teach us through this book? And, and most of the time, when we start a book, I have a general idea of what it might mean and where it's going to go and what we might learn from it. But almost all the time, I never know exactly where God's going to take us and what God's going to teach me through it. And so I kind of hold on kind of loosely and let God teach me as I go deeper in the Bible. Instead of bringing my own thoughts to the Bible and say, all right, this is, I know what this means and teach it, I just try to stay teachable throughout the series. And then usually by the end, it becomes a lot more clear. I let the Bible speak for itself rather than me trying to force my message on it. Uh, I, I thought about why 2 Corinthians is not as popular. I think one of the reasons is because a lot of people get into 1 Corinthians. And so I've, I've heard some teaching on the book of 1 Corinthians, there's, you know, chapter 13, love is patient, love is kind. You know, there's uh, the spiritual gifts in chapter 12 and 14. There's the resurrection. There's so many things in 1 Corinthians, and people study that, and people think it's for, for the church. But 2 Corinthians, um, it's, it's viewed more of as a book for pastors, actually, because in it, Paul talks about his heart as a pastor, as an apostle to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people, and Paul talks about everything he went through. Second Corinthians is the most autobiograph autobiographical of all the letters that Paul wrote. A lot of the letters that Paul wrote, um, you know, he doesn't share too much about his personal life, but in Second Corinthians, it's almost all about his personal life. Um, so we know more about Paul and the church at Corinth than just about any church in the early church and in the Bible. Uh, Paul stayed at Ephesus on his third missionary journey. He stayed at Ephesus for three years. 
But on his second missionary journey, I think he stayed at Corinth for 18 months, which is pretty much the longest he stayed, like Ephesus, other than Ephesus, the longest he stayed anywhere, because most places he stayed for a few weeks. Philippi, you know, Gal- the region in Galatia, um, all the other places he went to. Sometimes he stayed for two, three weeks, sometimes a little bit longer, but he would start churches and then move on. But Corinth, he stayed for 18, 18 months, which is longer than most places. So what is 2 Corinthians about? Um, 2 Corinthians is about, is actually one of several letters Paul wrote. We have only two of them in our Bible, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is actually not even the first letter he wrote to them. So we don't have that letter. Most people also think there is a letter between 1 and 2 Corinthians. So what's going on is Paul is in Ephesus, and then he's writing to the believers in Corinth, and he's writing back and forth. He's written at least four letters back and forth to them, and he's visited them several times. And then he sends Timothy and Titus and other people to disciple them and to follow up. And so this, this 2 Corinthians is possibly the last letter that he wrote to them. And in it, he, a lot of the time, he ends up defending himself and the gospel. Because what was going on is uh, in Corinth, a group of, quote, um, super apostles, special apostles ro- rose up in the leadership, and they accused Paul. They said, he's not a real apostle. His message is not true. They started to uh, assassinate his character. They said, well, he's so fickle, he changes his mind about coming or going. They said, in his letters, he's so harsh, but when he shows up, he's so timid and so weak. And they said, well, we charge because we're worth it, because in that time, the philosophers and teachers, they would charge a lot of money, and the more you charged, the more important your message was. They said, Paul doesn't charge anything. He says, we have letters of recommendation from famous people who endorse us. They said, Paul doesn't have any letters of recommendation, you know. They say, Paul, um, he doesn't really care about you. He doesn't love you. And they were just, so a lot of Second Corinthians is Paul explaining and defending his message, which is the gospel, and himself as a messenger, an apostle, a one who is sent by Jesus. And in doing so, he shares so many deep things about his life, about his personal life that we don't find from other places. And we hear his heart and how he really does love the people, how he truly has been called by God. And for the first time, he says, oh, you, you, you gave me no choice. I got to defend myself. I'm going to act foolish. And he begins to lay out what his credentials are. And um, he says, because it's not something that he usually talks about, but because the gospel, the good news that Paul is proclaiming is at stake, the message and the messenger, Paul arises and, and comes to the defense of that. And then part of 2 Corinthians, he also um, calls them out on a commitment that they made, but they were not following through on. They were going to support the, the believers in Jerusalem who were going through a famine, and so they were going to take up a collection and send the offering to them. But because they started following other super apostles, false apostles, Paul calls them, because they were doing that, they were not going to do what they committed to. So Paul calls them to renew their commitment to, uh, to strengthening and blessing the believers in Jerusalem. So that's kind of a very simple story. I'll, we'll get into it a little bit deeper as we go through each chapter of the Bible, of 2 Corinthians. But um, I, I want to read maybe three verses or so from 2 Corinthians to kind of give you an idea of what's going on, uh, or some popular verses. So these are some popular verses. I have about 10 or so. Don't want to spend too much time, but I'll just read three of them on, on the screen there for you. The first is 2 Corinthians 1.20. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. Have you heard that one before? All the promises of God are yes and amen. Uh, I won't put these on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 3.17 18, and 18 Now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's put this one on the screen, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a 
new creation. All things have passed away. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Second Corinthians, these I won't put up there, but chapter 5, verse 20 says that we are all ambassadors for Christ. Chapter 6, verse 14 says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Right? Chapter 9, verse 6 through 7 talks about for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's put this one on the screen, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Two more, I won't put these on the screen, but uh, chapter 12, verse 2 to 4, it talks about how Paul knows someone who was caught up into the third heavens and was caught up in paradise and heard inexpressible things that is not lawful for uh, a human being to hear. Uh, he talks about, uh, in chapter 12, verse 7, he says, because of the revelations that he received, God allowed a thorn in the flesh, and Paul prayed three times that God would take away this thorn, but God's only answer three, time was, three times was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so those are some of the popular verses out of 2 Corinthians. And you know what's funny, not funny but interesting and intriguing, is that this whole book of 2 Corinthians, it's not like Paul sitting down and trying to preach a sermon. Right? God didn't give us a theological handbook of chapter 1, you know, doctrine of this, and chapter 2, doctrine of that. You know, every, all the verses that I read about the weapons of our warfare to be cheerful in our giving, our call, what the Holy Spirit, all of this stuff, is, it just kind of happens to slip out as Paul is talking about his life and relating to the Corinthians, and because this is, this is life for him. And so it is, it is um, it's just kind of sandwiched in, in between all these stories and Paul talking about um, how God had called him to serve them. And so, uh, not just from 2 Corinthians, but from 1 Corinthians as well, we know a lot about this church. Um, maybe because Paul was there the longest, so he saw all the dirty laundry. <laughs> maybe because he was at other places less time, uh, shorter times. Um, according to 1 Corinthians, we know that he, um, there was immorality in the church. There was a man that was living with his wife, uh, living with his mother, and the church was okay with it. And Paul says, that's not okay. You need to call him out. And if he really wants to follow Jesus, you need to help him. Um, there were some people who were getting drunk at the Lord's table. <laughs> that, that one fascinates me. <laughs> it's like, because uh, Lord's table is not like, you know, we, we have a little glass of grape juice. Sorry to spoil it for you, but we don't use real wine. <laughs> we use a grape juice. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, they use real wine, and for them, it was not a, like a spiritual church ritual. It was just having a, a, a meal. Every time they would gather together, have a meal, and during that meal, they would break bread and drink wine together. Uh, that was the Lord's table, but some people were getting drunk and drinking all the wine, and uh, other people would come up and show up after work, and there'd be no, no wine, and these people would be drunk, and and that this was worship. <laughs> um, there was abuse of spiritual gifts. Some people are prophesying in the name of Jesus, but saying all sorts of weird stuff. They were saying, we're going to flow in the Spirit, and we're led by the Spirit of God. And Paul says, no, you don't have the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of the prophecy is subject, subject to the Spirit of the prophets. And he says, you need to learn proper discernment. He talks about uh, different following different leaders. They had cliques that some people say, oh, we follow Paul. Other people said, oh, no, no, we follow Apollos. And other people said, no, we follow these other apostles because they're the real deal. Paul doesn't preach a real Jesus. Um, there's a lot of other things that we learn. Um, they were sharply divided, had a lot of problems, issues of morality, they had spiritual problems, even to the point of saying some people were prophesying, say Jesus did not come in the flesh. They were saying all sorts of silly stuff, all in the name of Jesus. And while all this is going on and Paul is addressing them, he is across the pond in Ephesus. And what's going on with his life? 
His life is in danger. He mentions in 2 Corinthians, we despaired even for our life. You know, there was a riot in Ephesus. I, I visited that Colosseum, the stadium. It's like 20,000 people. They wanted to kill and, or at least hurt Paul. You know, he, his life was in danger. In 2 Corinthians, he lists all the things that he had to go through as an apostle of Jesus. He says, well, by the way, you know, this is what's going on in my life right now. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that was why I couldn't come to you. Um, and he begins to explain all of these things. And so it's an apostolic defense. But at the same time, it's very rich in teaching. Um, God didn't give us a theological textbook, as I mentioned. He gave us letters. He gave us psalms and songs and poetry. He gave us prophecy and verse. He gave us um, visions and dreams and some history. He gave us stories. He, he didn't just give us doctrine. He gave it in a context of how it's lived out. And everything we're going to see in the book of 2 Corinthians, it's in the backdrop of all this crazy, sharp division and, and Paul's life in danger and, and the church about to fall apart. And Paul is saying all these things, and we see with, with great humility he walks in, and yet at this moment he does need to bring correction because it's not just his reputation at stake, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ and their real, you know, and, the, and this true state of the church that he's responsible for. My, my other pastor when I, in my first couple of years of college was John Wimber. Last two years was Jack Hayford who passed away a few weeks ago. I, I talked about that and shared stories, but uh, uh, John Wimber used to say, you know, sometimes people think, you know, give me the deep stuff, deep stuff in the Bible. Give me like the, you know, the Melchizedek and all the great teachings that nobody knows about. And you know, he used to say, you know, the, 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 the meat is in the street. <laughs> the deep things of God are not in head knowledge and what you know of Greek and Hebrew and what you think you know of Christian doctrine. It's how you live it out in everyday life. And for Paul, really, he had great meat, <laughs> but it was lived out in the street of suffering, of misunderstanding, of great trials and maybe persecute, yeah, for sure, persecution. And it was lived out in that. And so his life and suffering was what brought purity and, and sincerity in his devotion to Christ. It's especially true in our sufferings and when we are searching for God and, when, and, and, and not just in our victories. So, um, one... One last thought I want to, a couple of thoughts I want to share with you, but um, one is that there's a call in 2 Corinthians to contend for the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. A call to contend for the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear, lest somehow, as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, remember how Satan came, the snake serpent came and tricked Eve uh, about God's word, what he said about taking the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Paul says, in the same way, I fear that uh, Satan has come and deceived your minds um, that, so that your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The NASB, the 1995 translation, uh, I'll just read it for you. It's not on the screen, but he says, but I am afraid that as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Uh, simplicity, singleness, um, sincerity, purity, graciousness, those are kind of what, what the word means. Um, and Paul says it in the negative. I, our faith is not a complicated, complex one. It's, it's quite pretty simple at the end of the day. We've, we love the Lord, we love our neighbors, and the doctrines that are important, it's pretty simple. Jesus, the Son of God, he came, and, you know, elementary school, a student can understand them very clearly. Um, and there's, so there's a simplicity and a, and a purity that Paul calls us to. Second Corinthians 11, verse 2, he says, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. 
but I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse 4, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. So what is Paul saying? I'm zealous for you. The reason I'm so passionately defending myself against all these false apostles that you're supporting and running after, the reason I am so passionate in defending myself is because God's given me a charge, and I'm kind of like the groomsman, and I want to make sure the bride is ready for Jesus, your betrothed to Jesus as a church in Corinth. And Paul says, I'm, I'm concerned, I'm afraid that Satan has deceived you, so your purity and simplicity of devotion to one man, Jesus Christ, has been corrupted. He's saying, other men are coming and saying, oh, I'm an apostle, follow me instead of Paul. And they're preaching Jesus, but it's another Jesus, not the Jesus that we see in the scriptures that Paul proclaimed. They're preaching the gospel, but it's a different gospel. And so Paul says, you need to be sober-minded. There is a simplicity and a purity. So the danger is not from the outside, the Roman government or, you know, our state legislator or whatever. The danger is not outside. It's not Satan with a, a red jumpsuit, <laughs> you know, and, and little cat ears and a long tail and a whip or, you know, it's, that's not the danger out there coming through enemies from without. It's enemies within. The greater danger that Paul calls to is the gospel and Jesus. He says the gospel you're believing in and the Jesus you say you're following is not the true Jesus who appeared to me from heaven and gave me this charge to, to present you to him. And that's why Paul is passionately defending the gospel, the message, and the messenger, him, as an apostle of Jesus. It's another Jesus. It's a different gospel. So he calls them to sincerity and purity of devotion to Christ. It's kind of like if, you know, uh, one of our members is engaged to be married, and, and in a couple of months, the ceremony is coming up. If, if for some reason, if, if the dude was God, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go after other women, we'd say, wake up, <laughs> right? We'd slap him silly and say, hey, come on, what are you doing? What are you doing? Right? That's what Paul is doing. Like, you, you were following Jesus. You had a simplicity and purity of faith, but you started adding all these things and you got distracted. He says, I'm going to call you back to Jesus. There is no other Jesus. There is no other gospel. That's Paul's passion in defending the apostolic, his, his call as an apostle of Jesus. The enemy isn't the Greek or Roman government. The enemy is not Poseidon or Aphrodite. The, those are the Roman Greek, Greek gods and goddesses that they worship there. Uh, apparently, there was a temple to Aphrodite there, and they did all sorts of immoral things to worship Aphrodite and the other gods and things. The enemy was not there, the government or other religions. The enemy was within their midst. It's like Peter had been revealed, we were talking about the last couple of weeks, you are the son, the Christ, the son of the living God. And then the very next scene, Jesus says, Satan, get behind me, right? The enemy's right there. Several chapters later, Peter, James, and John go up with Jesus at the transfiguration, and they see Jesus, his glory revealed for the first time in history, the glory of God on a human being as God's plan was, and Peter sees it, and Jesus says, Oh, Lord, Jesus, let's build three tabernacles. One to remember you, of course, but one for Elijah and one for Moses. And an audible voice from heaven comes and corrects him immediately. It's like if ever there was lightning to strike, this was it, right? Like immediately God corrects you. And that's serious. He says, This is my beloved son, in whom is my delight. Hear him. Right? And then they look up, all the cloud is gone, it's only Jesus standing there. Second Chronicles 7.14, God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves um, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Right? Never mistake that it's not if the government will change, if the people in the world will change their behavior and their culture and their morality, 
if the media will change, if the laws will change, and I'm going to touch on a touchy one, uh, if the abortion laws will change, which they did, and, but those are the secondary battles, right? The, the main battle and the main thing that we have control of is if my people, God says, it's my heart, it's my mind, it's a sincerity and purity of devotion to Jesus Christ, right? That's what's important, and that's what Paul calls them to. And so, yeah, I'm all for righteous laws that protect everybody. I'm all for those. But you know what? Laws will change, and when laws change, it will swing the other way with a vengeance in a few years, and then it will swing back and forth. You elect someone, and then much other way, stronger. Just, that's just the way history works. That's the way the flesh works. And God uses all that because at the end of the day, the pressure is going to get so strong until the great tribulation, until one world leader is showing up on the scene and saying, I have the answer, and I am the Christ, he's going to say, but he's not. And so that's where it's headed. And so Paul calls us to a simplicity and purity. We, 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 as a church, we can never have a victim mentality, right? Oh, the government hates us, the culture hates us, the, you know, wow, we need to defend ourselves. Uh, there's, there's a certain amount that is very righteous and proper and right to do, absolutely, right? And we live in a rep representative democracy. It's our duty to, to honor our state and the way our government works. You, you can't just pray and not vote. Yeah, you got to pray, you got to vote. It's, it's both. But we never rely on the government or culture or laws to dictate that God's spirit is going to fall upon our land, right? That is the sovereign prerogative of God. It's God who heals our land and he brings, pours out his spirit and sends revival. And so we cannot live with a victim mentality. The enemy is not the world. The enemy is not the government. Jesus didn't die for those things. Jesus died for me, for the sin and the darkness and the wickedness and the brokenness in my heart and in every heart. And so he calls us to repent and to believe in him and to turn from uh, turn to him. Amen. When closing, I just want to tell one story and then we'll close. Let me just say this first. Simplicity and purity is more about subtraction than addition. Simplicity and purity is about getting rid of what is not central and pure, getting rid of the cancer rather than adding more things to try to make it something better. It's, it's about purging, it's about decluttering, detoxifying, right? More than, you know, it's, it's about one thing, it's about Jesus, it's a simplicity, a singularity, a focus on who Jesus is. That's what Jesus is calling us to in this season. And I believe God is going to, in a moment, God can breathe on the church and Souls could be saved and in unusual ways. I'm, it's a, I'll, I'll share more during our business meeting what God's been doing, but uh, in a moment, God can multiply the DNA, but what, he is, what is he going to multiply? It's got to be pure. The seed has to be God's word. It has to be Jesus. It has to be the gospel. We cannot have 90% Jesus and 10% of fake Jesus. Right? We need to be completely simpl simple, single-hearted, and purity and devotion to Christ. And I'm, because of time, I'm, I'm wondering if I should tell the whole story. I'll just say it like this. Um, two, two times in my life, I thought God was going to kill me. Twice only. <laughs> it's probably way more. <laughs> I don't talk like this usually. I don't tell people God tried to kill me twice, but I escaped. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was twice I felt the hand of God on me. And there was a time in my life, in, during college, I was wondering, should I become a pastor? Um, I, I was an economics major, I was a philosophy major, should I go into, you know, a scholarship, should I go into business? And I wanted to become a pastor, but my dad, he had one of those profound encounters with God, with visions and revelations, and God just got a hold of him. I said, God, okay, I want that. I'm not going to serve you unless you call me like that. And I waited, and I prayed, and I fasted. And then one day, God took a hold of my life. He says, if you're not going to do what I called you to do, you're not going to live. 
I said, oh my gosh. Because I, I, I was more concerned about what other people would say if I could tell them, well, God called me to do be a pastor, so that's why I'm a pastor. I didn't take responsibility for my life and what I believe God called me to do. I wanted some prophet to tell me, oh, you're the man of God, you need to go into ministry. And I, I needed that affirmation. I wanted to be needed. I wanted, because I was fearful and timid. I was more fearful and timid of people than about God. And I was, I was insecure. I wasn't man enough to be able to say, God called me to do this. So I'm going to do this and obey God. So, so God helped me. He says, if you don't do what I called you to do, you're not going to live little man. <laughs> you didn't say little man, but that's what it, <laughs> and for, so for several days, you know how the, prof, the Bible says the hand of the Lord was upon me, and that's what it felt like. So I went into a ministry, and that, that's a whole long story, but um, um, God provided. But several years later, this is several years ago, I don't know, 10, 10 years ago or so, I, I became a pastor. I was pastoring here, and, uh, and I had so many things going on. We had prayer, prophetic healing. We had so many things going on. And I said yes to everything because I didn't want to disappoint anybody. It was all God's anyways, right? And so our building was freely used. Everybody just used it for free. And, and I, we didn't have much left to give because we didn't have money to upkeep the building and so many things. And, and one day, um, God dealt with me the same thing. He said, do the one thing that I called you to do. And the sense was, if you don't do this one thing, you're not going to live. <laughs> God never said those words, I'm going to kill you. Just don't misunderstand me. But that's what I felt like. If I don't do God call me, what God called me to do, what's the point of living? Like, who am I living for? For myself? For my parents? For the government? What? And so I had to come to terms and say, okay, God, I say the words, Lord, I give you my heart and send me anywhere, but I'm not really living it out. So God said, okay, little man, I will help you because I love you. Do the one thing that I called you to do, not the 12 different things. And I kid you not, that week, every human being I knew who was a pastor called me, literally knocked on the door, and after I would hang up the phone, another one would call, another one would call, another one would call, asking me for something. And I literally had to say, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> And it was, it was the funniest, funniest thing, but God was, it, it is quite humorous. And literally, I'd be hanging up on the phone, and someone would be, like, demanding on the door right there, like, dong, 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 dong. can we use your church for this? Dong, dong, dong. I, I was, like, hiding out. It was, it, there's a long story behind it. But. And then people that I love and have a relationship with through the years, other pastors, they said, David, we need this. Can we, and I just had to say, I'm sorry, no leave it at that. And they were upset with me. A couple of them were upset. At, one of them would accept that, uh, upset at me for a few months, but we reconciled. And, uh, but I had to bear the weight of that because I had to obey God, not human beings. Anyways, simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. All that to say, I think I could be following Jesus, and I say I love Jesus, and I, I got a little bit of God's power in my life, and, you know, people are listening, and people are saying nice things about me. We can't be content with that, all right? We need to follow the Lord. That's what we are here for. We're zealous to hear and to follow the Lord. That's what 2 Corinthians is about. Amen. Well, let's pray and we'll conclude our time today. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord. As we're in a spirit of prayer, I want to read a passage of scripture for you, and then we'll pray. It's from Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 27. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man came, will come, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. 
So as today we come before the Lord, I just want to call you to Jesus. I want to boldly call you and to say, follow Jesus. He is the glorious God who came, was born as a man, as a baby. He lived a sinless and perfect life. He died on the cross, not because Romans or Greeks or government held him there. It wasn't nails or metal that held him there on the cross. It was out of God's love for you. And so Jesus said to repent and to believe in him. Repent means to think differently about your life. Think again. What do you think the meaning of life is? Who is God? Why do I work? Why do I play? Why do I do the things that I do? What is life about? Why do I wear the clothes that I wear and eat the things that I eat? Jesus says, life is more about clothing or food. And so I want to call you to repent today. Repent means to think again. Think, about, think again about who God is, what life is. And Jesus says, come to me. Put your faith, put your trust in me. And so I want to call you to that. Life is not about the comfortable things we enjoy here in America. Jesus says, I am life. The way and the truth and the life. And if you want to follow Jesus, he says, come, everyone who wants to. He says, but it's going to require everything. Surrender your life to me. And so, Lord, as we come before you today, I just pray that if you're calling anyone here to respond, I pray that you would come by your Holy Spirit, bring conviction, bring, uh, bring your word, your spirit to bear down upon our hearts. And if you've been sitting here today and you're sensing the love of God, the love of God comes in Jesus. Jesus, who is dying on the cross. It's not a fleeting emotion. It is an undeniable reality of God himself, the Son of God, dying on a cross for you. And so if that's, if you're here today and you want to give your life to the Lord or come back to him, then this is an opportunity for you to talk to God and say, Lord, I admit I live in brokenness. This world has no answers. I come to you. I want to turn and think differently about my life and about you. I believe in you, Jesus, as my Lord. Be the, be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. So just respond to the Lord today. Lord, I just pray for everyone here that, that we would, you would grant us a simplicity and purity of devotion to you. We want to follow you. We want to serve you. We have too many distractions, most of my own choice and making. Would you woo our hearts to you? Through Second Corinthians, Holy Spirit, would you draw our hearts? As we say, we're here because we say we want to follow you, Jesus. Help us, Lord even in our weakness and in our suffering and our trials. Let it be a launching pad for us to dive deep into trusting in you, into the ocean of your love, into your strong arms. So Lord, I just pray your grace and strength for those who are going through hardship and trials and temptation and, and tribulation, trouble. Lord, I just pray your strength. As Paul was going through all of those things, you strengthened him. You gave him a single focus upon you, Lord. Would you bless each and one of, my, uh, of us here in this place with that simplicity and purity of devotion to you. We say we are yours. Thank you, Lord. We receive your strength, your joy, your power, your healing, whatever is needed to bring forth your kingdom and your will. Lord, we say have your way. We are yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, if you if God was dealing with your heart today, just wanna let me know. Um, share with me here today or over 
uh, email or message us on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll be sure to pray for you and encourage you in your walk with God. All right, so we're going to have our church business meeting, our family meeting, annual church business meeting. We'll start in about five minutes. So, ooh, it's not just chips and salsa. What is that? Is that donuts? <laughs> Vaughn, save me one, whatever that is. <laughs> so five minutes, we'll get started. Uh, so love on a few people before you go. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.